Good day folks, Jordan here, today with a video on another server, but it's not what you might expect. And this is what I'm talking about. So let's get into it. Today, I present to you the HP MediaSmart server EX470. And for size comparison, because pretty much all of these servers were basically identical in size, here is a Dell Optiplex 790 small form factor for a bit of size comparison. If I show you the top down view, you can see that this is a very shallow computer, although it is quite a bit wider, of course, to accommodate the hard drive sitting flat inside of a caddy. But still, it's quite impressive the size and footprint that this would take up compared to a standard business class small form factor computer. The EX470 was released in October 2008 for a original retail price of 599 US dollars. And what that bought you, as far as the technical specifications were concerned, was a custom motherboard, which is proprietary to this form factor. It has an AMD Sempron 3400 plus processor at 1.8 gigahertz. It has 512 megs of RAM, and it also got you a 500 gig hard drive in these hot swappable drive bays on the front. There have also been some hacks made with some of these machines by some hackers and enthusiasts, which have allowed this machine to take up to two gigs of DDR2 RAM and also have a VGA output for a monitor, as typically these HP MediaSmart servers are not able to output video out of the box at least. In addition to the EX470 model, HP also released the EX475. The only difference between the two is that the EX475 bought you an additional 500 gigabyte hard drive in the system when you got it new, which would have cost you an additional $150. Yeah, back then hard drives were not as cheap as they are now, that's for sure. Now, what made this server so significant is this is one of the very infamous servers that ran the Microsoft Windows Home Server operating system, a Windows Server 2003 R2-based operating system, which was modified for the consumer market to have 10 client licenses and an easy-to-use interface, which would allow backups and media streaming from this box to any device that was on the network that either was an Xbox 360 a Windows XP, Windows Vista, or even at later times, Windows 7 computers. And it could actually, you know, somewhat work with Windows 10 devices to this day if you so desired. At least in this original release, that was the case. If there's any popular request, I may consider actually covering the operating system in a software overview video at a later time. But for now, we're mainly going to be taking a look at the hardware which powers this operating system, which, as you can see, is this lovely little box right here. Now, on the front, it's very open. There's a lot of open holes inside of this door, which has little windows to show which drives are currently installed, active, or failed, whatever have you. There are LEDs behind this. I think there's a blue one and a red one. Blue one obviously indicates that the drive is functional. Red means that it is failed. And obviously not turned on means it's not installed. Of course, there are four toolless caddies. This bottom one houses the boot drive and or the first storage volume. The unique thing about Windows Home Server, and this is different to that of Home Server 2011, or for that matter, most other operating systems, in that... The way that this actually uh, made its storage volumes was basically doing a hot swappable JBOD method rather than doing RAID. Although RAID was supported, it was actually a unique feature of Windows Home Server for home use where a consumer could just grab an off-the-shelf hard drive, probably up to two or four terabytes in capacity. I think it might have been a two terabyte drive limit for this thing. I couldn't tell you for sure. Just pop it in one of these caddies and then they could actually, on their computer, allocate their volumes, expand them, do whatever they wanted. Now, unfortunately, this feature was removed in the later release, Windows Home Server 2011, and that was because Microsoft uh, favored RAID over doing the JBOD method. And there's been some outcry over it, or there was outcry over it, but at the end of the day, uh, doing the hot swap method that 
uh, Windows Home Server initially did. I don't remember if it did redundancy or not. It may have, uh, just in the event of hard drive data loss or whatever have you, but uh, obviously RAID has hard-coded redundancy in the form of actual physical redundancy. So I guess it's down to preference whether or not you'd actually consider it to be better or worse, although most consumers back in the day thought it was worse. But you know, potato, potato, tomato, tomato, whatever. So back to the overview of this machine. Now this door actually comes off, if I'm not mistaken, and it lets you like get access to a little bit of the motherboard, but not too much. And uh, obviously the boot volume is behind a lock, so you can't take it out while it's locked. Not the most clever idea, but hey, it's something. I'm surprised that they don't have like a key lock on this, but I guess it's a consumerized device. So you, can't, you can't be too hard on it, I guess. But definitely if this was enterprise quality, they'd have a key lock on the boot drive if this was the form factor they'd used. I digress. So down below, you have a few indicator LEDs for power, network, and the diagnostic light, which is a dual color LED once again, blue for normal, and it will actually shine red if in the operating system it detects a critical fault. There's special software to light this light up red if that so happens to be the case little pinhole there but i don't know what that's for or if that's just a physical defect on my unit and then a usb 2 port on the front so this machine has a total of four usb 2.0 ports and they can be used for expanding the storage or connecting up devices to be shared on the network such as a printer if it's not a network printer you could actually have this act as a print server which is a pretty nice feature of course that's nothing new for windows server but certainly for its day in the consumer market, this was a pretty nice feature to have. On the back, once again, it is fairly open for ventilation purposes for the hard drives. I believe there are a few different fans inside this case. I know there's one in the power supply down here, and I know there's probably like a couple others in the uh, case somewhere, if I'm not mistaken. But you also get three more USB 2.0 ports there. You have an eSATA port, which is eSATA version 2, so it's a 3 gigabit per second port. You have a gigabit Ethernet port right here, which uses a Marvell Yukon Ethernet controller, so something of decent quality. There's your power inlet and a Kensington Security lock slot. And there you can see the HP MediaSmart server badging there. And there is the power switch on the back of the server. So nobody can just walk up and easily hit the power button. They'd have to reach behind here and know where the power button is, and then they can hit it. So usually you just turn this thing on and forget it, like most servers. In this video, I'm not planning on doing a disassembly of this because it is quite a difficult job to take it apart if I don't remember properly. I can't recall for sure, but I will go ahead and power it on, and then we will do a remote desktop into it and take a look at the operating system briefly. It's nothing too fancy. If you've ever taken a look at Windows Server 2003 R2 before, then it'll basically be identical because there's not too much different. But we'll take a look at the uh, Windows Home Server console from the server itself and maybe some of the HP specific things. There's not too much modification, but it's still interesting to look at nonetheless. Or at least I think it looks interesting nonetheless. And obviously you might think it's interesting because you're watching this video. So let's go ahead and get this thing hooked up and powered on. All right, so I got it hooked up to power and Ethernet. And now we can go ahead and power it on. And then I'll go to my host and we'll try connecting to it via remote desktop connection. Yeah, it actually moves quite a bit of air on this first power on self test. You can probably hear the operating system starting up. Apologies about the thing on the screen. Um, as far as the moray pattern, there's nothing I can really do about that. I'll be recording from my phone and all, but here, let's go ahead and connect to the server. It should be on the network, and it is. So, of course, there's a couple certificate errors, but, I mean, this is server 2003 R2. You can't be too hard on it. And it looks like it has gone to the other display. So, okay, we'll go to the other display then.
Now from this screen, you might think that this would have been based on a different version of Windows because the background has influences from Windows Vista. In fact, it even has the newer style of Windows branding with the newer style Windows logo, albeit without the orb over it. And you'd be pretty close. But no, this is just a reskin of Windows Server 2003 R2 for small business server, like I mentioned earlier in the video, just customized to suit the home needs a little bit better than the enterprise, or in this case, small business. Yeah, so anyways. So here we are logging on to the desktop. And obviously, it's very bland, bland, bland. And normally there would be a wallpaper here, but I believe uh, because I got it turned off, or maybe it's turned off due to the remote desktop connection priorities, there's an HTML file on the desktop which I believe would auto open, but it's been disabled. And what it's supposed to tell you is you're logged onto the Windows Home Server desktop. Many standard Windows Server administration tools are available from this desktop can break Windows Home Server because again, based on the operating system underneath. To avoid potential problems, use the Windows Home Server console on a home computer. So they're just basically saying you can access the same connector software from another computer that's connected on the network instead of having to remote log into the actual server itself which would probably be true in most scenarios. Speaking of that software, here's the shortcut on the desktop for the Windows Home Server console, so we can go ahead and launch it here. Sorry about my Discord going off in the background. I will actually say this has been upgraded as far as its RAM goes. It was previously modified to have a one gig RAM upgrade, so it's got half of its maximum amount of memory, which actually does help quite a bit as far as the performance is concerned. A lot of it can actually cache into the RAM can't imagine what the performance would have been when this thing had 512 megs of RAM when it was new. I mean, probably wouldn't have made much of a difference because back then, of course, uh, Service Pack 3 wasn't out, or in this case, Windows Server 2003 R2 Service Pack 2. So anyways, I digress. So here is the main console that you would see in the case of this particular HP Media Smart server with the original installation on it. So you have quick access to your uh, some of the features of the server, such as your photo web share, you can have an iTunes server running off of this thing, which is pretty cool. You have quick access to your add-ins. You can even change the brightness of the LEDs on the front panel, which is pretty cool. So for example, um, if I look up here, you can see the LED is actually fairly bright, but I'm gonna go ahead and see if I can actually turn this down live on the camera. So uh, here we go. You can see the lights get dimmer and brighter. This is a real time change as I'm doing this. So that's actually kind of cool. But for the sake of the rest of this video, I'll go ahead and I'll leave it all the way up. And of course you can also check for updates, which I don't think HP has any updates for this anymore, either that or they have uh, been all run or whatever have you. We would connect, nope, oh, it looks like it said it couldn't connect to that service. So darn. So I don't know, maybe the server has been taken down and there's a newer update that I'm just simply missing or what the deal is, I couldn't tell you for sure. But anyways, I digress. So there's some other things that you can access from within here as well. Again, you could also do this on a client, but since we're remotely connected in, we can go and do this. Notice all the Windows Vista-like icons. Uh, obviously this is from the era of Windows Vista. So this would have probably been mostly tailored to it. This is where you could show all the computers that have been connected to the software that are currently doing backups, which as you can see, I don't have any that are inside of here right at the moment. And then you can remotely start a backup, configure a backup, so on and so forth. And then you can also add up to 10 user accounts in this list for uh, other devices in your home. This is where you can configure all of your shared folders and what is shared on the network to all the users. And then this is where you would have the hard drives of your server show up, be it integrated ones on the uh, rail or the, the sleds on the inside of the server itself over USB or over the eSATA. And I believe you can also add network drives here if I'm not mistaken. You can actually really soup this thing up with a bunch of storage. Of course, I love how it says SCSI even though it's just your standard off the shelf serial ATA hard drive. Of course, this thing has some old folders, old crap that I haven't yet gotten off of it. So that's why this uh, network thing is at risk, but it's not a big deal. So here's the settings. 
It's got quite a bit of options in here uh, regarding the iTunes server, software updates, hardware status. Here it'll actually show you the temperature of the CPU, the fan speeds, voltages, and you can also have that health LED on the front turn red if this network thing or whatever is set to critical, it will then shine that blue light on the front red instead of blue. This has BIOS R02 on it, and that's the software version. I don't know if actually any BIOS updates were ever released for something such as this. I couldn't tell you for sure, but either way. And of course, you can install add-ins here. I don't think there's any up anymore, but back in the day that would have been the case. And then of course, Windows Media Center, you could have used either a Windows XP with the Media Center Edition computer, Windows Vista, or an Xbox 360. They all would connect through this Windows Media Center, and you could then use it to stream content over your network, be it wire or wireless. Backups and more, all that fun stuff. This thing was actually previously used for a media streaming server over the network for somebody's home. And as such, they used a streaming software program known as Firefly Media Server. I believe this predates something like Plex, if anybody knows what I'm talking about. So, as you can see, it would stream music, uh, video, pictures probably, and then you could then have the server running on the network, connect to it for something else like, I don't know, Cody or whatever. But anyways, so yeah. And then uh, there's some of the plugin information there. So anyways, otherwise not much is on this. It actually has a utility for the SIS VGA, which is not actually able to be used. So it does have a VGA device. You just can't tap into it. And I believe if I'm not mistaken on this server, there is actually a PCI Express slot on this motherboard. Of course, you can't access it from the outside of the case, but I believe there is a PCI Express X16 slot on that motherboard, and then you can actually plug in a graphics card to it. And I believe if you were to actually update the BIOS, you can equip this with a dual-core processor, one of them Athlon LE-based dual-core processors, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, you could also use some others as well. Otherwise, it's just your basic Windows Server 2003 for small business server install. It's got all your standard utilities and everything else regarding the operating system. Really, I guess the only major thing is just this Windows Home Server stuff. And just for funsies, here's the Windows Home Server system panel. Of course, out of the box, this was registered just as Windows Home Server. And you can see the processors an AMD Sempron 3400 Plus with one gig of RAM and a physical address extension. In fact, I think if I'm lucky, we might just be able to run CPU-Z on this and we get a bit more insight onto this. I think it's actually socket AM2 because of the fact that it is running DDR2 RAM, but let me see if I can load a copy of CPU-Z on this thing, and we'll take a look at that real quick before we wrap this video up. So here's the processor. Again, a Sempron 3400 plus on the Manila core, and I was right, socket AM2 and 90 nanometer technology. Sports SSE 3, MMX, uh, SSE 2, I don't said that again. <laughs> Anyways, so this actually can turbo up to its uh, standard clock speed of, I believe, yeah, 1.8 gigahertz, but it can like slow down a little bit. Of course, here you can see the BIOS is version R02 by Phoenix. It's got one gigabyte of RAM. It's only single channel because there's only, well, one accessible slot. I kind of surprised that it actually shows like four slots but obviously there's only one on the motherboard and it can take up to two gigs and then of course there's no graphics because i'm on a remote desktop connection so there you go pretty simple look at this machine and its capabilities and whatnot so for now at least that'll be it for this video on the hp media smart server i don't know what i'm going to do with this thing other than potentially make it a file server reuse device for XP 2000 95, 98 based devices as it uses older SMB technology and whatnot. Although I suppose I could probably do the same thing with my Windows Server 2019 Essential Server. This one will probably be more suited to the task because I could just keep older things on this server rather than clogging up my main server for newer things, but I digress. So if you guys like this video, well, then that button will let me know that you liked it. The other one will let me know if you disliked it. If you want to see more content just like this one or 
hopefully even more entertaining content, there's a red button down below that says subscribe. It'd be nice if you clicked on it. And yeah, that's basically it. So thank you all for watching and I'll catch you all in the next video. Thank you.